have two to three months of cash on hand. And if you don't have that, I would say work on over the next few months, like prioritize putting money into savings. Even if you can't do the full two to three months, anything is better than nothing. Welcome to Profit and Prosper, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are ready to make some money while doing what they love. On this podcast, we're going to pull back the curtain and talk about all things business and money, but I promise you this is not your typical boring numbers talk. I'm your host, Sarah Young, a CPA and CFO with over a decade of experience in finance, business, and leadership. I'm going to share everything I've learned from helping my clients grow more profitable businesses and keep more of what they earn while growing my own successful business along the way. You'll feel empowered and confident that you too can grow your wealth, live a rich life, and have an impact. Stick with me and you might even start to think that finance is fun. Let's dive in. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the podcast. We are on episode 57, and today I want to talk about the Silicon Valley Bank failure and what that means for your business. So by the time this episode comes out, it will be, it will have been a few weeks since the bank failed, and probably this feels like old news at this point, but I really want to talk about what happened and what this means for your business and some things that I think you should consider Um, because I think it's really important to consider that anytime we have this kind of big shakeup happen in the economy. So let's dive into, you know, what happened and what you need to do for your business. I'm going to try to keep this as high level as I can. Actually, as I was like doing the reading and watching videos and doing my research to pull this together, it was taking me back to my college days because in college I majored just in business, but my focus areas were finance and economics. And I spent a lot of time in a lot of classes talking about banks. And (laughs) there's definitely some things like that went into why all of this failed that you really do have to have a solid understanding of economics and banking, which is very complicated to be able to understand in depth. So I'm going to keep this high level and explain it in a way that hopefully, you know, anybody who doesn't have a business or finance or banking degree or background can understand. Um, so that you you can get a grasp of what's going on and how it might impact your business. So to explain what happened, I'm going to first explain quickly how banks work because you have to understand how banks work in order to understand why SVB failed. So when you put your money into a bank, you put cash into a bank account, banks only keep a portion of the cash that you have deposited actually in their bank. So they're not like keeping, let's say you put $100,000 into a bank account. They don't have like a stack of $100,000 in cash that they just have in a safe somewhere that is like, this is, you know, Sarah's money. That's not the way it works. So banks take a percentage of the cash that you deposited and they hold that in cash to, you know, cover for when people want to come and withdraw money from their account because they're banking on pun not intended, they're banking on not everybody coming at once to take all of their cash out. They know based on history, they only need to keep a portion of that readily available for in cash for people to come and grab out of their accounts. What they do with the rest of that money is how banks make a profit. So what they do is they take the rest of the cash that they don't keep on hand and they use it to invest. They use that cash to invest in things like other people's debt. So giving, using that money to give to other people in the form of a loan, a car loan, a mortgage loan, a student loan, personal loans, credit cards, any form of debt, the cash is coming from your deposits that you have on hand. So they give that out and they make money in the form of interest. They give you a tiny sliver of that interest and they keep the the delta between what they charge and what they pay you. They use the delta to fund their banks. Now, they may not always be able to give the cash out in the form of debt just because it depends on like how many people are asking for debt and who's qualified and so on and so forth. And so what they do with the rest of that is they invest it into other things that they can get a good return on um, that are fairly stable. Things like treasury bonds, you know, mortgage-backed securities, 
all kinds of other things like that, that maybe get a lower interest rate than what they get when they loan the money out in the form of debt, but they still make interest on the on those other um, investments that they make. I just I don't want to go into it in this episode, but I want to drop a little earworm here and start asking the question of why can't you do more of what the banks do? Not to fail, obviously, but if you're going to put cash into your bank account and based on this bank failure, you know, there's a risk the banks might fail. Maybe it may be a small risk, but like there's a risk and you're only going to get a tiny portion of interest. It's certainly not going to keep up with inflation. Why not do more of what the banks do in the form of investing in bonds, investing in treasuries, things that are fairly stable, but give you a better interest rate than what you get on the banks? Um, Or even maybe even next level investing into other things like giving loans to people in exchange for interest. That is totally next level. But I do think it's a valid question that I have had raised after watching all this happen. And so I just want to drop that little earworm for you. The other thing I want to talk about is the FDIC. Um, This is what ensures your deposits. And so you get up to $250,000 of your cash money um, secured per bank, per account holder. So it's not per account, but like if you have three accounts at one bank, with all of that cash, you will have up to $250,000 insured. What that means is the banks pay insurance premiums, much like we do for any other type of insurance. Banks pay insurance premiums that go into this fund, and then that fund is there to be able to make people whole up to that $250,000 limit on their bank account. So you probably also heard things going on around the SVB bank collapse around people having money in excess of that limit. So I think it's important to know that any cash you have in a bank per account holder, you have insured up to $250,000. And this is not paid for by taxpayers. So I'll touch on this again in a minute. But when the government decided to cover everybody's deposits at SVB, this wasn't something that was paid for by taxpayers. It was paid for by the premiums that banks pay to fund this like insurance policy, basically. Now, you could argue that the costs that the the cost to the banks of the insurance is definitely something that would trickle down to consumers in the form of higher interest charge on loans, less interest paid on bank deposits, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's high level how banks work. So let's talk about what happened with SVB. So Silicon Valley Bank is in Silicon Valley. It's been around for a while. It heavily invested in tech startups in Silicon Valley. During the last few years, this bank grew massively. So startups had have a lot of cash in the bank because if you think about that business model of being a startup, they go out to investors and they raise millions and millions, sometimes billions of dollars to fund their startup, right? And so they're not necessarily spending all that cash at once. They're using it to fund future expenses because startups typically operate at a loss. And so they need that cash to pay their expenses over the coming years. So SVB had massive growth from 2019 to 2022. They went from being the 34th largest bank in the United States to the 16th largest bank. Because lots of companies were getting funding, lots of these tech companies were really flourishing during COVID because more people were staying at home and spending more money on the things that they sell. So the banks, you know, during pre um 2022 times, you know, before interest rates started rising, banks were buying a lot of these bonds with the cash that the bank, that the, you know, the bank's customers had on deposit. And so SVB was buying a lot of bonds at super low interest rates because before, you know, six months or so ago, when the Fed started increasing interest rates, interest rates were super, super low. And so, the bank's so SVB was using the cash that these tech startups had on hand to go and buy a lot more of these types of treasury bonds and things that were at super low interest rates. If they were to have held these bonds, you know, until they matured, which could be five years, 10 years plus down the road, if they were to hold them until they matured, they'd have really no issue, right? Because basically the bonds work by 
you say, I'm going to give you $100,000 and in exchange, let me actually use an easier number. I'm going to give you $100 and in exchange, you're going to pay me 2% interest per year. And then at the end of the 10 year term, you're going to give me the $100 back. So every year for 10 years, you're going to get $2 in interest. And then at the end of the 10 years, you'll get your $100 back. Okay, that's how bonds work. As interest rates have been rising, all these bonds that they had at like really low interest rates, as interest rates rise because the Fed has been increasing interest rates to fight inflation, the interest that they received from those bonds at really low interest rates was not keeping up with the rising interest rates in the market, which means super high level without going into all of the weeds of the math. When interest rates rise, that means that the bonds are not worth as much. Had they sold those bonds, SVB would have had a total $17 billion loss. That is how much they bought off of this money that all of their clients had deposited with them. They would have had a $17 billion loss if sold, according to my research online, okay? However, right, if they were to be able to hold them until the bonds matured, they wouldn't really incur a loss. They'd get their money back, and sure, they could have done other things in the meantime, that would have given them a better interest rate, but not the not the end of the world if they can hold it until they mature. So what happened more recently, you know, starting in 2022 and into this year, some tech companies, startups starting hitting started hitting financial troubles. So you probably have seen in the news about like how Facebook and other tech companies have been doing these massive layoffs. And that is primarily because during COVID, when they were doing really well, they started, you know, their sales were going up, things were good. They started hiring more people and investing in more of these projects. But then as sales have started to slow down as we're moving out of COVID, they have to lay people off, you know, their profit is tanking, and they need to use the cash that they have in their bank account. So they had all this cash sitting there. And now they're like, crap, I need to use this because our profitability is down. So as SVB's clients started having to use the cash that they had in the bank, SVB had to start selling their bonds early before they matured and at a loss, right? Because remember, they only keep a portion of the deposits on hand. The rest they give out in debt or they use to invest in things like bonds. And so to fund the deposits that the customers were keeping and to keep their required you know, percentage of cash on hand of their deposits, they had to start selling these bonds early at a loss. So the reason the SVB failed was because on Wednesday, March 8th, SVB made an announcement that they were going to have to sell a whole bunch of their bonds at a loss of $1.8 billion and that they were going to do a round of funding. And what happened in Twitter, like online, is people started spreading rumors about SVB having trouble. And so what happened was their clients started to freak out, causing a bank run. And so a bank run is when you're when their clients all go to the bank at once, and you know, they don't have they they don't have enough cash on hand to fund everybody taking their money out all at one time. What happens is more and more of their clients went to the bank to go draw their money out right? Because they're freaking out because they're worried about the bank failing. So it's really a self-fulfilling prophecy because they freaked out and because they took their money out, the bank then failed. So to fund the deposits, SVB would have had to go and sell even more of their bonds at even more of a loss, incurring more of a loss, causing the bank to fail. So by that Friday, I think it was March 10th, Basically, regulators had to come in and just shut the bank down and pause everything. The tricky part about SVB is because they were heavily, heavily invested into startups. They had all these businesses there. A lot of businesses have more than $250,000 of cash, especially startups who have tons and tons of funding, right? So based on what I read, SVB had $150 billion of uninsured deposits, meaning deposits above that 250 k limit. So what the government decided to do in this case, because these are businesses who have to pay payroll with the cash that they have in their accounts, right? 
think about it. If the businesses, if all these startups weren't able to pay payroll and the startups start to fail, then there's a whole even bigger trickle effect on the entire economy. So regulators said, hey, we are going to cover 100% of the deposits of everybody at SVB in order to avoid any larger impacts. And remember what I said about the FDIC being funded by bank insurance premiums. And so this was not something like funded by taxpayers because I saw all this stuff on Instagram about people like, oh, why can they bail the banks out again, but not give me my student loans back? Like this is a totally different thing. Are you ready to create a profitable business and use that cash flow as a fire starter for building your wealth? Since you're listening to my podcast, I'm guessing that you probably do, but maybe you aren't sure exactly how this would work for your business or if it's even possible for you. But listen, I am here to tell you that it is possible because I have worked with so many women business owners who have done exactly that. You can pay yourself a six-figure CEO salary and get yourself out of the feast or famine cycle where you're worrying about cash flow all the time. You can create a profitable business model that allows you to outsource and delegate so you can take time off from your business while still growing to the next level. And you can use that cash flow to start building a seven-figure portfolio of retirement, real estate, or whatever else you're interested in. If you're an established online or service-based business owner who likes some hands-on CFO support to increase your profit margins, build your business to the next level, and grow your net worth using that extra cash flow, then the Millionaire CEO Incubator is exactly for you. The Millionaire CEO Incubator is my signature six-month group coaching and done-with-you hybrid program to help you map out and implement a plan to turn six-figure cash flow into seven-figure wealth. We take on a handful of new clients each month by application. So if you're ready to change your money story, go to profitandprosper.co forward slash apply or the link in the show notes and fill out the quick application. It should take no more than two minutes and we'll be in touch. Now let's get back to the episode. All right. So now that we have covered what happened to cause SVB to fail, hopefully in a way that makes it easier to understand. I want to talk about what you need to do and things that I want you to consider for the health of your business. So I think, you know, had you asked me this a month ago, or had you asked me about the recession a month ago, I would have said, you know what, based on what I'm reading, it seems like the odds of a steep recession, a deep, deep recession are super low. And the odds seem to have been leaning more in terms of the economy staying flat or maybe having a mild recession. If you go back to episode 30, this was back from last September, I think, I did a whole episode on what you should do to prepare for a recession. So go listen to that. I'm not going to go deep into all the stuff I said in that episode again, but all of it is still totally valid. But in that episode, I talked about how normal it is to have recessions. And so the fact that we might go into a recession should not be cause for huge alarm. I think a lot of us, especially I know many of you are my age. I'm 36. When I graduated college, it was right in the middle of the Great Recession, which was the deepest recession since the Great Depression. And I want to be clear, like not all recessions are that bad. Now, no one can predict how good or bad or mild the upcoming recession will be. But had you asked me a month ago, I would have said it seems like the likelihood of a deep recession is low. It looks like it will be somewhat mild. So not a huge, huge deal. Now, based on these bank failures, I think the reality is, you know, what happened to SVB can happen to other banks if they are not, you know, sufficiently prepared in terms of their balance sheet to be able to cover, you know, having to sell off securities at these losses. So, you know, keep that in mind. And then if it were to keep happening, if more and more banks fail, then yeah, obviously like that's going to deeply impact our likelihood of going into a recession. So I think compared to a month ago, there's probably a higher risk of going into a recession. Um, I would still say, again, no one can predict with certainty it's probably not going to be like as terrible as the Great Recession, but maybe it has a chance of being worse than we thought a month ago. So what that means for your business, I think, is one, as always, I probably say this in every other podcast episode, 
This is a really good time, I think, to make sure that you have cash in the bank. So make sure that you have a cash cushion. Make sure for your business you have at least two to three months of cash on hand to cover spending so that if your sales do slow down, you got a runway and you have the time to pivot and make decisions, right? To change your business um, and you can keep your team, you can keep things running for a couple of months if you need to. So have two to three months of cash on hand. And if you don't have that, I would say work on over the next few months, like prioritize putting money into savings. Even if you can't do the full two to three months, anything is better than nothing. At the same front, like make sure you got your personal emergency funds funded as well. So I would say at least three months, if not six months of personal cash on hand, potentially, you know, more if you just want to be more secure, potentially going into a recession. So make sure you have cash and let's prioritize cash to give you a runway in case things go bad. And also because during times of a recession, I said this in episode 30, so go back and listen to the full explanation, but times of recession, things tend to be cheaper to buy. Assets tend to be cheaper. Stock goes down. Real estate tends to drop in value. This is an amazing time if you have cash to start buying things because you can get things at a discount. So keep cash on hand to fund your runway, but also to use to make investments. The other thing that I'm advising a lot of my clients to do, and it depends on their business, but what I'm advising a lot of them to do is to delay any new major hiring or spending. And that's not to say, like, I just posted literally a few days ago, I just posted two new roles. They're both part-time. And, you know, it, it again, it depends on my on your business as to whether you should delay hiring. I have other clients who hired quite a few new employees in 2022. And I'm like, you know what? This is a great time to sit in what I, what I call profit mode. Instead of trying to double down on any crazy new growth, since you just did that last year, let's really just focus on stability. Really just focus on doing the things that you do well, doing that well, and use the assets that you already have at your disposal before you go and make any new major spending and hiring decisions. And so I'm talking like, you know, don't feel bad if you need to hire a part time person or something along those lines, but before you go hire full-time people, I just really want to make sure that you've got cash on hand and that you feel really good about the stability of your sales coming in over the next, you know, six to 12 months. I have another couple of clients who, you know, they're pretty open about wanting to buy real estate. And so I think that the recession, you know, like I said, this can be a great time to buy real estate because things get cheaper, but it's also um, right now interest rates are very high. So if you are going to be taking on debt, just understand that interest rates will be high. So if you want to take on debt anyways to buy something like an office building, I just had this conversation with a client the other day to buy an office building because it's a good deal. I think understand that you may need to think about the potential of one, having high interest payments for the next few years, but then also like, can you put yourself in a position where you could refinance that later as interest rates drop? Okay. So just taking on debt and, you know, really taking on a ton of like new spending, heavy, heavy spending decisions. I'm not talking like, you know, a few software things here and there, a part-time person, but like major, major spending, like I'm going to invest a ton of money into a whole new sales channel. Really just make sure that you feel confident in the stability of your business and that you have cash on hand. Also, I think it's a good time to remind everybody that diversification is really great. And so diversification in everything we do um, from who are your clients So looking at your clients and saying, are they the type of client who is potentially going to be heavily impacted by a recession or do they have money either way? Looking at where you get your leads from, making sure that you're able to generate leads. And so if one source of leads dries up, you're not tied to just one like funnel, you know, to bring your leads in. Diversifying the things that you offer and your price points to, you know, draw people in who might otherwise hesitate to spend. and. A new diversification um, idea that I'm going to give you is diversify your banking. So specifically around like seeing this SVB failure, you know, when it comes to your banking, I think, you know, a lot of you listening, you may not have $250,000 or more in your bank account, but some of you probably do. 
So I think the important thing is, number one, to stay calm when it comes to banking, uh, because part of the reason SVB failed was because people freaked out. They lost their shit and they all went to take their money out. And that literally caused SVB to fail. I think looking at where you bank is also important. And so you may want to look at spreading your money out. Like I would probably keep your like normal operating accounts where they are. But looking at if you have a a large savings balance in your business or even in your personal life, like maybe look at putting that in another bank because the FDIC limits apply to, you know, each individual bank that you have. Um, And so you can keep yourself, you know, at or under or at least closer to that limit if you spread your cash out. So that is something to consider. So we have a lot of our clients will say, you know, have your operating accounts at this one bank, but then let's put your excess savings into a high yield checking. An example would be Live Oak. Live Oak Bank has um, a pretty good high yield business savings account. So, you know, make sure you're looking at where are your accounts and do you need to diversify the banks? Because, you know, it's not likely if you have accounts at more than one bank, it's not likely that both banks are going to fail at the same time. And then you also want to keep them under the limit. I think also looking at the size of your bank. So honestly, smaller banks, regional banks are more likely to have these issues because they just don't have the portfolio that the large banks do. So I really hate saying this, but it could be a time to look at having some accounts at some of the larger banks. I personally have my business checking accounts at Bank of America, and I kind of hate that (laughs) Um, because I don't necessarily love Bank of America as a company. But when it comes to, you know, my business checking accounts, I'm not playing. Okay, what I tend to recommend, we have a lot of clients will say, you know, have your main accounts at a Bank of America or at one of these larger banks, but then also have accounts at some of the smaller regional banks. I usually tell people to go and get a line of credit at like a local bank or a regional bank because the customer service is way, way, way better than you'll find there. But I'm not sure I would recommend having at this point, given what happened with SVB, having all of your bank accounts in one place. Okay. The last thing I think is make sure you know, I, I told you have your cash cushion. I know some of you have more than two to three months of expenses sitting in your checking account at your business. And so I think one thing that you should take away from the SBV failure is that it may not be the best decision to pile all of your cash up in your bank account beyond the cushion that you need. Okay. So take the money out. If you're hesitating to take the money out, let this be a sign that maybe it's time to go and do that. So pull some out above and beyond the cash cushion that you need, like pull some out and put it into your personal bank so that your money is not all tied up in one spot. That is it in terms of my thoughts and recommendations on what the SVB bank failure means for your business and really just thinking about the recession. I would still recommend go listen to episode 30 where I talked about um, more in detail how to think and handle a handle a recession coming up for your business. And so all of those things that I said still 100% apply. And, you know, I'll leave you with this. I think keep in mind like what you're spending on, but if you are unsure how to navigate times like this in your business, I think this is an amazing time to have someone who can be a financial partner for your business. Because Times like these, I'm going to tell you my clients when they have questions about, oh my God, what does this mean for me? And I'm in their back pocket and they can pull me and my team out and just say, hey, like, please talk me through what should I be doing right now? What are what are you seeing specifically to my business? What are the risks that I have? These are the times when it's really valuable to have that level of support. And so if you are looking ahead at 2023 and you're like, you know what, I'm not totally sure how to navigate all of this please reach out. You know, we have different service options available for different types of businesses. Like, please reach out so we can look at getting you the financial support you need to make sure that you can navigate these potentially, you know, tough upcoming economic times. Okay. If you want to talk about it, if you want to say like, hey, Sarah, like how can you help a business like mine? send me a DM on Instagram. I'm happy to, you know, help you and like get to know your business a little bit. You can fill out on our website at trustyoungco.com at the bottom of any of the pages. You can fill out an inquiry form if you want to talk about our tax service, our tax and bookkeeping service, or our CFO service. And if you're interested in the Millionaire CEO Incubator, where 
anybody, any of my clients in Slack, anytime they ping me and say, hey, like this is happening, what should I do? I'm there to support them too. That one you can apply for at millionaireceo.co forward slash apply. Step away and think about, you know, what does this, how does this apply to your business? What does this mean? What are some actual like tangible things that you need to do to make sure that you are set up for success during, you know, an upcoming potential recession to make sure that your business is sustainable and lasts. All right. So I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts or questions, you know, let me know on Instagram at it's Sarah Young. If you want me to send you some articles and videos that dive deeper into the behind the scenes of what happened with the banks, I have a bunch of them saved from, you know, doing my own research. So let me know. I'm happy to share. All right. So I will see you all next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Now, I want you to go take some action. What's one thing you can do this week to create more profit in your business? Send me a DM on Instagram at youngcocfo and share your action item with me. If you have a question or topic you'd like me to dive into, or if you're feeling empowered about taking charge of your finances, let's continue the conversation. Go to profitandprosper.co to submit a question or topic for me to talk about on the show. And because we all profit and prosper better with friends, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe wherever you listen, and share the episode. Make sure you tag me at CFO on Instagram so I can give you some love, and I'll see you in the next episode.